Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dima Schlichtenko. I'm the director of IPAM, and it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the Green Family Lecture, uh, the last one of 2018 and the first one of this academic year. Um, as you know, IPAM is a uh, unique institute located on the UCLA campus. It's one of several nationwide NSF-funded mathematics institutes. Uh, IPAM's goal is to connect mathematics and other disciplines. Uh, these other disciplines could be more mathematics or other things. Uh, and I'm sure that you'll hear, hear a lot about what mathematics can do um, this day and age from our, our uh, speaker. Um, I would like to uh, tell you that IPAM, um, for the most part, runs uh, scientific programs. We are part of a three-month-long program right now, um, and these Green Family Lectures are part of actually a workshop that's happening at IPAM this week. Uh, we run two long programs a year in addition to various workshops. We also have uh, programs aimed at students. And uh, the Green Family Lectures um, is uh, one of uh, IPAM's activities that's designed to bring the most eminent scientists uh, to UCLA to give lectures to the general scientific public. Uh, these lectures were started by a very generous donation from uh, Mark Green's family, and Mark Green is right here in the first row, uh, so maybe we should give Mark a big round of applause. Um, and uh, in the, the first Green Family Lecture, I believe, was in 2012. And since then, uh, there were at first once a year, and then with even a, a further donation to IPAM from Mark's family, we uh, were able to now do it twice a year. So stay tuned. We'll have another Green Family Lecture coming up in January by Barry Barish. Um, I would also like to thank uh, many of the people involved in the production of this, uh, including Stacy Beggs, our assistant director, our videographer, Kaylee Steele, uh, and uh, IPAM program staff that has been essential in, in, in helping us in, in every way. There are many ways that you can be involved with IPAM. Uh, of course, you can, you're welcome to uh, register and come to our programs. Uh, you're welcome to uh, propose activities at IPAM. But also, if you would, are interested in uh, getting on our mailing list and things like this, we have uh, what's called the Frontier Society, where for a small annual fee, uh, you can support our institute and, and uh, get invitations to events such as this one. So if you're interested in this, make sure that you take uh, one of our newsletters or talk to one of the program staff as you exit uh, the, the hallway. All right. Um, without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, one of the people that uh, uh, so the person who will be introducing uh, Emmanuel Candez, uh, Terry Tao. Uh, Emmanuel Candez is no stranger to IPAM. Uh, in fact, one of the early things that has happened at IPAM is something called compressed sensing. And I just verified just now that it actually happened at IPAM, not at UCLA daycare, as we were told. So, you know, it's one of those things that uh, grows some moss and, and, and becomes one of the folkloric tales of mathematics. Uh, it's such a, a, a wonderful achievement. And uh, Terry just told me that, of course, they did work on this quite a lot while waiting for their kids to uh, let go of them at daycare, right? But um, it actually started at IPAM. So anyways, here's Terry Tao that will be introducing our speaker. Thank you. OK, so it's a great pleasure to in, uh, introduce my uh, old friend and collaborator, Emmanuel Candes. Uh, so Emmanuel was a PhD student at Stanford. Uh, his advisor was David Donahoe. Um, so um, during two, from 2000 to 2006, he was at, at uh, professor at Caltech, um, and he also was at IPAM. This when I, when I started working with him, um, and then when, when IPAM ended, we were fortunate that we both had the kids in the same daycare, so we kept working together very conveniently uh, every every morning. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, he's now the um, I can't read my own writing. Um, okay, I'm sorry, he's an endowed chair at Stanford, but I can't actually read the name of the, of, of the endowed chair. Sorry? Okay. Um, in mathematics and statistics. Um, he's won many, many awards. Uh, I'll just mention the uh, Alan T. Waterman Award, which is the highest scientific award of the NSF uh, in 2006, and the MacArthur Award uh, Fellowship, uh, often known as the Genius Grant, 2017. Uh, so he's worked on many things. Um, Often, bridge, often bridging together pure and applied mathematics. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he invented um, um, curvelets, for instance. Uh, he worked with me and others on compressed sensing, 
on matrix completion, uh, on super resolution. And today, I guess he'll be speaking uh, on um, scientific re reproducibility uh, with uh, his talk on saving through data, discoveries and mirages. Okay, so. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? All right. It's always a great pleasure for me to be back at UCLA. In fact, uh, as Terry said, we spent 10 wonderful years of our life here. And I'm always very happy to come back on campus. It's perhaps my favorite campus in the United States. All right, so today I'll talk a little bit about uh, statistics and challenges in the data-driven uh, scientific world. And so um, to begin with, uh, Galileo famously said that the laws of nature are expressed in the language of mathematics. And that is certainly true. And the development of mathematics has gone hand in hand with the development of physics and of the physical sciences in general. But what we saw in the 20th century, which was termed the statistical century by my colleague Brad Efron, is the eruption of a new science, namely statistics, which considerably extends the range of problems that quantitative reasoning is effective at dealing with. And so not only uh, we can deal with problems in physical sciences, with statistics, but we can deal with problems in the life sciences, in the social sciences, in economical sciences, and so on and so forth. And what's exciting about all these fields is that in all these fields we have theories, and these theories make experiments, uh, make predictions, sorry, and it's important to test the predictions against carefully collected data sets. And the thing is, as you all know, is that nowadays, you know, when we make an experiment, the answer is not black and white. We have to deal with a fair amount of uncertainty. And statistics is precisely the language that helps us understand this kind of uncertainty and reason about it. And so um, I just decided to emphasize an early success of statistical thinking, uh, which is the Salk vaccine trial from 1954, aimed at eradicating polio uh, within the United States. Polio claimed many lives, especially among children. And statistics was used for two things. One, to design the experiment itself, that is, how are we going to compare children who receive the treatment from those who do not receive the treatments? How do we make these two groups equal? And second, of course, in the, analyst, uh, in the analysis of data. And so this is an enormous triumph of statistical thinking. And since this early success, of course, we have, when I say we, the community of statisticians has perfected uh, these techniques. We have refined protocols. And now we have rigorous um, uh, clinical trials that, to the best of my knowledge, uh, bring drug to market that help you rather than hurt you. And so this has enormous policy implications. And there was one president in the United States who said, you cannot be a citizen of this country if you do not know statistics, <laughs> which I like very much. <laughs> okay. Now, fast forward to 2018, has something goes wrong? This is a cover of The Economist from a few years back of October 2013. And it seems that we're facing a crisis that I'm sure some of you has, have heard about, which is that science is the thing that should replicate itself, but it seems to replicate less and less. And so there was an article that really triggered a lot of discussion, which was published in Nature in 2012 by uh, Bigley and Ellis, Nature 2012. And this experiment reports disturbing findings. And disturbing findings have been reported in a lot of different venues, for example, in the field of psychology, for example, in the field of neuroscience. But focusing on this Nature article, here's what uh, Elias and Bigley report. There's a company which is not based not far from here. It's, I think, in, in Southern Oaks uh, called Amgen. Um, they took 53 studies that they considered to be absolutely landmarks in basic cancer science, the stuff that you want to replicate. Um, and they attempt to replicate those, and what the article reports is out of these 53 attempts, they could only replicate six out of 53. And these are important papers, papers that you would see published in the leading journals in the field. Healthcare Bayer, which is a German equivalent of Amgen, uh, did something similar. They took 67 seminal studies. Perhaps some of them are the same. I'm not quite sure. Uh, and they could only replicate less than, 25th, 20, less than a quarter. And so there's been, throughout psychology, systematic attempts to replicate 
experiments about priming. Priming experiments are, I don't know, like uh, you have kids and you want them to do well on a mass test and you would take a group and you're going to make them think about Terry Tao. You're going to take another group and you're going to make them about Leo Messi. And the, the theory is that if you think about Terry, you'll do better. But these experiments do not tend to replicate very well. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is gaining national and international attention uh, in the local newspaper, the Los Angeles Times. Uh, you know, you have articles such as this, science has lost its way at a big cost to humanity, a new truth that only one can see, the truth wears off. It's everywhere in the popular press, and I'm sure some of you have seen articles like this, and the press seems to delight into the fact that we think we're doing, we think we know what we're doing, but maybe we're not. I want to study, uh, I want to just mention that this is something that is well known to the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, when you, as I said, when you want to bring drugs to markets, you have to go through a very rigorous process. And you reach, sometimes you reach what they call to be phase three. And phase three should be a slam dunk. But what they find is that 50% of the things that go to phase three that should be slam dunk, in fact, they end up in failure. And that actually is a failure rate in phase three is increasing with time. Okay, so this is a concern. So we see lots of articles in the media, and if I just try to extract snippets from the media and see like really negative words like uh, uh, significance chasing, publication bias, selective reporting, one article that is cited enormously in the media is the article of my colleague John Ioannidis from Stanford who wrote a very influential paper, the paper that everybody knows, entitled Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, where he claims that about 80% of what you see published in the life sciences does not stand up to close scrutiny. So I think this is quite alarming. Um, as probably you know, uh, science is at an all-time low in terms of public confidence in this country. Um, you know, witness the kind of discussions we have about vaccination and other topics or climate. And of course, articles like this are not helpful. Uh, there's a great danger in seeing further erosion of public confidence in the science. And I think the last thing that you and I want is to be seen as politicians. But I have to say that the science community is taking this extremely seriously and is trying to do everything it can to fix this problem. So I'm going to mention some initiatives uh, which are really a, a step in the right direction. First is this reproducibility initiative. It's an exchange. So you get extraordinary results, but you're a bit worried about uh, whether you should publish them because maybe they look too good to be true. Then you can actually go to this kind of uh, initiative and you know, deliver your protocol and everything, and they will try to replicate it for you so that you can run these things um, before publications. And you have a reproducible initiatives in many uh, different uh, fields of science, for example, in, in cancer biology. And sometimes they will actually do this for free. Usually they do it for a fee, but sometimes they do it for free. Obviously, that's a step in the right direction. Another thing that has received a lot of attention is the fact that the major leading newspaper, scientific magazines, are very aware of these issues. This is the editorial of Nature of 2013, at about the time the Economist uh, uh, articles came about and, you know, nature recognizes that over the last few years they've published stuff that does not make sense. And they've changed their editorial line and their new editorial line is now that all the stuff they did not care about, which is the data analysis, the data, the method, the robustness to parameters and so on, now apparently they want to see. And so they ask for reviewers to do a very thorough job and, uh, and authors to do a thorough job at submitting their code, their data, and so on and so forth. And many, newspa many newspapers, many magazines, sorry, scientific publications are taking similar steps. For example, science is doing the same. It, again, that's a step in the right direction. Um, at the highest level, people seem to take this issue extremely seriously. Uh, this is the President's Council, the former President's uh, Council of Advisors at White House. Um, and, you know, you know, at the agenda, the White House agenda is improving scientific reproducibility. It's extremely important. People talk about it. People talk about it in the White House. And more locally, in my communities, you know, we are trying to do everything we can to do something about this problem that seems to plague the science uh, circles 
at the moment. Okay, so why is this happening? Why do we have a reproducibility crisis? Well, there might be many, many factors, and some of them have to do with the publishing culture that requires us to work on very big science projects, where I think now when you look at the kind of articles we see published in leading magazines, I don't know that there's a single person on a paper that knows what's in the paper from beginning to end because they're so complex and so much about big science. Second, the grading agencies' cultures. Well, I've been told that if you want to get some money from some granting agencies, then you need to get claim extraordinary research, otherwise you will not get funded. You know, and so perhaps a granting agency culture is at stake. And honestly, these are way above my pay grade. I mean, I can talk about them, but there's not much I can do to change one and two. There's a third issue, which is the issue of computational reproducibility, the sort of GitHub model where you put your code and stuff, so that, that's not really what I want to talk about. It's great to do this, we should all do this, but I don't think that's where the problem lies. The problem lies in four. The thing I can try to tell something intelligent about is in the era of big data, when we look everywhere at once to find interesting things, how should we declare that we have found something valuable? How do we choose a statistical, uh, how do you choose a finding in this big data world? And so this talk and this talk and the next one will be about statistical methodology that if applied properly might enhance replicability. Okay. So I think it is not a coincidence that we have a reproducibility crisis at the moment in which we have an explosion of data. And I think if you look a bit at the people, what people do in the labs nowadays, I think it's fair to say that we have turned the scientific method upside down. Before, about 20, 30 years ago, we were doing science the way we were told to do science. So you formulate a hypothesis this, or theory. The theory makes prediction, and then you collect data and you test your predictions. But now we have huge data sets that are available prior to the formulation of scientific theories, and we're going to elaborate theories and test hypotheses on the fly. And so I think we've changed from a world of a Popperian world, if you will, to a world where now we collect data and then we ask questions rather than the other way around. And because we've turned this thing upside down, that changes everything. And so it's very different from the hypothesis-driven research that we used to do. Now an example, which is dear to my heart, but also dear to IPAM, because I have to say that IPAM has been a lighthouse uh, very early on, is in the field of genomics. And one of the first workshops that IPAM ever organized was in genomics. At the, at the time where these kind of DNA technologies were exploding, and people were claiming things left and right. So if we look at the field of genomics, historically I think it is fair to say that molecular biology was very hypothesis driven. You would hypothesize that the function of this gene is this, and then you would design experiments to actually test your hypothesis, one gene at a time. But something in the 90s happened, which we saw the eruption of the high throughput technologies, where now we can measure on a DNA microarray chip the expressions of almost all of the genes at the same time under different cell conditions. And so now we move in a world where we can see how all the genes vary at once. And we have lots of number of variables, all these genes, relatively few number of people, few people with a medical condition that we care about, and researchers begin to look everywhere. And so that, that eruption of technology completely changes the way we do science. We moved from something that was completely hypothesis driven to something that is completely data driven. And there's nothing wrong with this. But we have to be careful with what we do. Because we cannot continue to do business the old fashioned way. Okay, so why is it that we might see an explosion of things that do not reproduce? So I'm gonna introduce you to the notion of false discovery rate introduced by Benjamin Jan Hochberg in 1995, something that has influenced my thinking enormously. Suppose I'm in some field where I want to, you know, maybe genes are of interest to me. So there are a thousand genes of interest to me. And maybe, I mean, I don't know, I'm looking at some functions, I'm looking at a lot of genes. I have a thousand genes, I'm gonna collect data about a thousand genes, perhaps expression levels for a thousand genes. And 
maybe there are 100 genes that are what I'm going to call non-null. Yes, they are differentially expressed in, within these two conditions. And these non-null genes, these discoveries that I'm, I could potentially make, they're indicated by these yellow squares. Are you with me? OK. So we're going to put them in a corner. And that's potentially, all of these are genes that are null. They don't have, they're not interesting. They do nothing. And these are potential discoveries that I could potentially make. And now I'm going to collect data. And when I collect data, what happens is if I test hypothesis at the 5% level, then I'm going to have three types of outcomes. I'm going to have the false positives, which is what we're going to care a lot about. This. Things I believe are significant that I should report because they pass the time-honored 5% p-value cutoff. I have true positive, things that pass the cutoff and are actually true and replicable. And then there are yellow things, things that I missed. These are false uh, negatives. And so if I test this hypothesis at the 5% level, then how many uh, false positive do I expect? Well, 5% of how many there are, 900, that's about 45. And then how many blue guys do you, you, you expect to have? Well, that's a question that people, statisticians call the statistical power. And so in this example, the statistical power is 80%, that your chance of discovering an effect when it's really there, you've sized your study so that it's 80%, it's going to be about 80 and so what you do is you reject what you, you report what's been rejected, so you report the blue and the red. So you re the number of false discoveries you uh, report is um, the true positive uh, are here, the false positive are here, and so the fa false discovery ratio is the expected ratio uh, between the false positive versus what you expect. In this case, it would be roughly 45 over 80, which means that about 36% of what you're reporting cannot reproduce. And now we could actually be a bit more dramatic. We could say, well, what happens if I'm like in a prospective mode? I have perhaps a lower sample size so that the power goes down. So if the power goes down, then there will be the same number of red things, but the number of blue things will go down. And so most of what I report now ends up to be not replicable. Okay? And I think this has to do with our problem. Okay, so after this sort of lengthy introduction, I want to just tell you a little bit about what we've been working on with a, a bunch of collaborators, starting with Rena Barber, who used to be a postdoc of mine at Stanford and now has a stellar career at the University of Chicago, Ying Ying Fan, Luke, uh, Lucas Jensen, a former student of mine, and Jin Chi Liu. Okay, so we're going to try to develop methods so that it's going to tell you sort of what you can report safely. And uh, we're going to be inspired by some modern problems in, in modern science. And one modern problem, one that I heard a lot about when I was at IPAM in my early days, by the way, is this. It was where people were actually trying to complete the Human Genome Project. They had started it. And the idea is we're going to sequence people. And so we're going to measure. Uh, people know what is a SNP, a single nucleotide Cleotide polymorphism. People know what that is? Yeah? Okay. All right. So the idea is we don't have any theories about which genetic mutation are in the pathway of some disease. So we're going to type, we're going to measure the genetic mutation, and we're going to try to correlate this with phenotypes we observe. And so the problem is very simply stated is that we have a response Y, for example, whether I have the Crohn's disease or not. I have lots of variables that have been measured about me. For example, I have my genotype information at hundreds of thousands of locations. And the question that people want to know is which genetic variations affect the trait? That is the risk of getting a disease. I don't have a theory about this, but I have lots of data. And that's become really cheap to actually genotype individuals. And that's a question we want to answer. Now, I'm at a workshop at IPAM. I see a lot of faces from IPAM. We're not talking about prediction. We want to understand which mutations are in the pathway of some disease in a way that when I give a list to a biologist, this is reproducible. That she's not going to waste more than, say, 10% of her time following up leads that I give her. It's not, the problem is not to predict cholesterol level fr from my genotype information. For some simple reason, and if I want to know my cholesterol level, I can just measure it. I don't need a, genome, a full genome sequencing. 
but I need to understand which variables unambiguously affect some disease or cholesterol level so that I can do research about it. It's the first step of a long process. I need to inform the biologist of what is it that she would need to study first in such a way that she would not waste more than, say, 10% of her time. I think that's a big problem because, you know, I could ask lots of problems like this. Whenever I look, I see problems of this kind. Which gene, ex we can measure gene expression profiles very easily. Which of these gene expression profiles determine the severity of a tumor in such a way that it, my response is sort of unambiguous? Which factors or variables have determined whether a loan will be repaid? Okay, so this is not a prediction thing. It's I want to know who is in the pathway. And so, the question that we want to ask is, how can we select variables without too many false positives so that when I publish work, it's not invalidated two years later? Because someone has run a study and says, Emmanuel, what you're reporting, I can confirm. Okay, so we're going to formalize the selection problem a little bit. And this selection problem, we're going to be more formal about it if you come on Thursday. You don't have to come, but if you come on Thursday, this is a problem that we're going to formalize quite a bit. It's, I have a cohort of people, and we can think about it this way. I'm just going to keep on with my genetics example. And they come to me, and they have their genotype, and they have their phenotype, whether they have a form of cancer or not. And so this is a variable, and this is a response. And so I have thousands, if not millions, of variables, and I want to know which one is important. And so the question mathematically that I'm asking is this, that there is a, a likelihood, a chance, of having cancer given this NIP information. And this is a very high-dimensional object. It's a conditional distribution of a phenotype given 300,000 things I've measured. It is very reasonable to assume that this conditional distribution does not depend on 300,000 things. I don't think that there are 300,000 mutations in the pathway of some phenotype that I'm observing. Only perhaps when I ask geneticists, they say, how many? They say a few dozens, maybe a few hundred, but not 300,000. And we want to know which one they are. And so mathematically, we can ask the problem in, in this form. A variable for me is a discovery. It is something that I want to report if, and that's important, if the, 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 the distribution of the response, given that I, I take into account all the other explanatory variables, all the other SNPs, and that one, if it changes. If that doesn't change, if I have an equal sign, it means that the response is conditionally independent of this variable, and I do not care about it. Because I can already predict everything there is to predict by forgetting about this variable. So I'm going to say that a variable is of interest to me if it changes the distribution of the response condition on what I already know, beyond what I already know. Okay. Okay. So that's the problem we wish to solve. OK, formally, uh, we want to know for those of you who do a bit of math, I want to test whether y and the variable xj are conditionally independent given the rest. Does xj provide additional information about the phenomenon you're studying beyond what you already know? Okay. All right, so I'm at a terrific workshop. It's all about big data, big computers, big algorithms, very fancy stuff. And uh, we live in the computer age. And now people are going to try to solve these problems using very fancy computational tools. And they can include deep learning. They can include random forest. They can include some very fancy MCMC calculations and so on. We have lots of tools to try to tease out signal from noise. And that's what a lot of you guys do. And they are so complex, these tools, and so delicate. If someone knows something about the statistical distribution of deep learning parameters are fitted on some data I'd like to talk to you, that we're going to treat them as a black box algorithm. We're going to use some very fancy method, but that method is so complex that I'm going to think about it as a black box. Okay? So we have an algorithm that's going to try to tease out signal from noise, but we're going to assume that it's a black box because it's too complicated what it does. And so to show you that the problem is hard, here is a simple model where there's a response y. There are some variables x, and y depends on x in some fashion. And I use one of these black box algorithm here. It's for those of you who know, happen to know about this, it would be a regularized uh, logistic regression, a bit in the style of what we've heard this morning. 
And so I've got importance measures by looking at the size of the regression coefficients after proper regularization and so on. But when I repeat the experiment on the same statistical model, this, the same method, I get something like this. When I repeat a third time, the model is always the same, but the data changes. And so I get different statistical estimates. I get something like this. A fourth time, I get something like this. You get the picture. I see tremendous variability. Okay, that's a fifth time. Unfortunately, I cannot see all of this, so I cannot learn the joint distribution of all these dots. I only have one realization, and that's the question I'm asking. Should, is this big enough to be reported? Is it above threshold? Should you go out and say, gee, I found this. I need to write my Nature article. Or is it not significant enough? And I think here we are at the heart of some of the most exciting problems in science. There's this beautiful quote by Johan Benjamini and Johan Hechtlinger that says, is this really modern science? You know, when we think about early statistics, we were trying to distinguish a single signal from background noise. And now things have changed. Now modern science faces a problem of selection of promising findings from the noisy estimates of many things. So who are the promising guys in this picture? OK. So now we're going to introduce some new methodology that was developed with uh, Rena Barber, as I mentioned earlier. And so the idea is quite simple. Now, how this is implemented, that's a completely different ball game, and that's why we have a second lecture on, on Thursday. But I want to give you the, since it's a public lecture, I want to give you the gist of the idea. And then if you're interested in learning more about this technology, uh, you're welcome to, to stop by on Thursday. The idea is to create fake variables. So you give me Terry's genome, which is quite exceptional. <laughs> and what my algorithm will do, it will create a fake genome. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to run your algorithm that evaluates the importance of variables, not only on Terry's genome, but on Terry's genome and some fake genome that I'm going to construct in a special way. And so. What we're going to do is we're going to run this black box algorithm that scores variable according to presumably their importance, but by running it not only on the original set of variables, but on the state augmented with some fake variables. And so we're going to get two types of scores. We're going to get the scores that the algorithm assigns to real things, actually the real things I measured in the lab. And we're going to get scores for things it gives to stuff actually created on my laptop independently of anything. Okay, and we're going to try to compare these two sets of numbers we get to try to determine over here what's happening over here. OK, so to give you a sense of what the method does, it does the following. Let's go back to the previous example. This is my example. This was this example. It's exactly the same example. But now I augment the features with some knockoffs, some fakes, and I rerun the algorithm. And when I rerun the algorithm, I can see that the algorithm gives this importance measure to these knockoffs. We call them these knockoff features and these numbers to the true ones. And so just to give you a sense of how I think about this is that the black box selects 49 original features. When I say it selects, it means that it assigns non-zero values to 49 guys. But it also assigns non-zero values to 24 knockoffs. What that tells me immediately is that in this thing, there are probably 24 false discoveries. That is, if I were to, rec to report this and publish this in Nature, out of these 49, there would be about 24. In fact, here, since I know the grand truth, since I manufactured this example, there are 25 false discoveries, exactly 25. My estimate is 24, they're exactly 25. So I would never really report this, because then my false discovery rate would be roughly 1 in 2, which is not acceptable. We cannot do science and published papers where every other thing is just not reproducible. OK. So now, how am I going to construct these knockoff features? Do we have uh, statisticians in the room? One, two? OK, not many. OK, so one we could think about is, here's one thing we could do. We could create fake SNPs. So that is, we could take an excellent genome, like Terry's genome, and say, how do we create knockoffs for Terry? Like, let's put my genome. Yeah, my genome is really bad. <laughs> and so I might I actually be able to distinguish between Terry's good genes and Emmanuel's, but we're going to pair it with, um, with, uh, with the phenotype. So what I could do is I could try to augment features 
by actually constructing fake features by essentially copying the genome of someone and make my fake variables this way. Of course, there is no relationship between this fake genome and the response since it comes from a different person. That's what statisticians would call the permutation methods. What I'm doing when I do this is I break the relationship between this and the response. Now, I do something very strong when I do this. Why do statisticians like this? It's because the distribution of the fake, because I'm just randomly pulling out a genome from someone, is actually the same distribution of this. So this fake features have the same distribution, the same joint distribution as the original features. But that doesn't work. And that doesn't work for very deep reasons. And that maybe I'll explain on Thursday. But let me just show you through this through an example. Here we go back to the original example we've seen before. And now we have three colors. The reds are the true variables in the model. So these are the things I want to find. The light blue, the C blue, are the things that I do not want to find because they are not in the model at all. These variables do not influence the response. And here we have the permuted feature. And so if I remove the true signals, if I just focus on what I do not want to report, then I get something like this. That's the score, that the, that's how the algorithm scores variables that do not influence the response in any way. And that's how it scores important features obtained by permutation. And there's no way I can gain information about what's going on here by seeing what's happening here. Let's look at a different scoring algorithm to really drive this point home. Um, okay, so but now if I were to use knockoffs, which we, I'm gonna show you a bit how you do. If I were to use knockoffs, I would get something like this. And clearly there's something captured by the levels of this thing that is captured over here. Now let me give you another way of scoring uh, variables, something that looks differently. Um, so again, red means stuff you want to discover, blue means you, something you do not want to see. Let's remove the red so that we focus on what we should not be reporting. These variables do not influence the response. But this is the score that the algorithm gives to things that are real, and this is the thing that I would get if I were just applying this permutation trick. And that does not look like this. But if I use knockoff variable instead, well, I'm gonna get something like this, and there's a lot of, at least visually eyeballing, a lot of similarity between the values over here and the values over here. And maybe I can use this to use statistical terminology. I can use what I see over here as a form of calibration, what statistician would call negative controls. Okay. All right, so how are we gonna make these fake features? Okay, so that's where uh, we're gonna work on Thursday. On Thursday, we're gonna see a lot of this, but just in a, in a nutshell, so the strength of the method is that I, you don't need to tell me anything a little bit. It's, you don't need to tell me anything about how Y depends on what you've measured. On the other hand, what I need to know is I need to know something about the distribution of the features, which for many problems that I care about is a reasonable assumption and something we'll discuss in detail. So I'm gonna assume that I have variables X that try to explain a Y. I know roughly the distribution of the covariates, perhaps because I have a lot of unlabeled samples, as in the case of geno genetic studies, where we've genotyped millions of individuals by now. But I do not know at all how the phenotype of interest depends on these variables. And now the construction is very simple. You give me a, a, geno a genotype over here, and I need to create a, a fake genotype. Snip by snip, I need to do it. And what I'm gonna require of this fake genotype is a property which is, you have to think a little bit about this. I'm gonna require this property. I'm gonna require that, see, you give me a bunch of features. What the computer will create is will create fake features that goes with it in such a way that if I were to swap a true feature and its knockoffs, if I were to swap them, then the distribution would be unchanged. So it's a, I need to augment the variables you give me with fake variables with the following property that when I swap a true variable and it's knockoff, the joint distribution is invariant. Now this property immediately implies that the fake features have the same distribution as the X's because I can swap everybody 
and I can marginalize. And what that means is that the fake features have the distribution of x. But it means much more than that. If I look at, for example, the distribution, the, how x1 and xj correlate, what this equation says is that the correlation between x1 and xj is the same as the distribution based on x1 and the fake xj. So they are dependent on each other. This cannot be sort of independent of x. x wiggle, that's why the permutation doesn't work. The fake features cannot just be a random sample from something else. If I were to do the permutation method and I'd say, this is a correlation between two nearby SNPs on Terry's genome, this would be high because they're co-herited. But the correlation between Terry's SNP and mine is low because we are independent individuals, and so that would not do it. Instead, what we require is that when we build these fake features, we want to be able to swap fake and true without changing the distribution. And this is, we're going to talk about this on Thursday, just as a probability question. Algorithmically, how would you do this? I'm not going to say it today, but that's for Thursday. But that's kind of the cool stuff about this is, I give you a bunch of x's. Algorithmically, how do you create fake x wiggles so that you can swap them and do not change the distribution? What would you do? Okay. In this lecture, yeah? But that's the same. If I permute the y or left the x's alone, it's exactly the same thing. Permuting the y is breaking the relationship between y and x. This is not what this is doing. What? That's fine, but that's that. But that's not what what's that's not. See, when I permute the y, I basically break the relationship between y and x. So I'm putting myself under what statistician would call the global norm, but I'm not under the global norm. So, so. Okay, yeah. Of course, you could. Okay, well, no, you could. I mean, that's a very good question. You have to ask questions because this is a conceptual part. Yes, you could. And the method has no problem with this. But what the method will do in this case, it will discover nothing. Because you're going to ask me, you're going to ask, you're going to, ask me to distinguish between true variables and a copy of true variables. I cannot do that. And so the algorithm will refuse to make selection. Yes, yes, yes. So this is Thursday. Yes. So I, I mean, I can see this is a place where everybody is smart. Um, what would I want to do if I could have it my way? Give me a P, generate X wiggle so that the mutual information between X wiggle and X is minimized. X wiggle is as far apart as X under this constraint. These are really linear constraints if you think about them in terms of probability distributions. And now minimize the mutual information or if you want, maximize the conditional entropy. I want x wiggle to be as unpredictable as possible, given x, subject to this constraint. That's what I would want to do. OK? But this is a very good question. And the algorithm does not look at my phenotype to make these variables. It makes them agnostic. So by definition, these variables do not provide any information about y beyond what's already known. So they are nulls according to my definition. And we're going to use them as negative controls. OK, so now we go through this deep learning, MCMC, whatever you want to use, this black box. And all I'm going to ask this black box does, so maybe we can forget about what's on the board. All I'm going to ask that this black box does, it does treat the variable in a democratic way. It does not use information about who is a true variable, who is a knockoff. It's a, it's a method that is democratic. It doesn't have access to who is a true variable, who is a knockoff. So for example, that's true of everything I could think of using. If I'm going to find the coefficient in some penalized regression of some kind, it doesn't matter in which order I give you the variables, you get the coefficient. OK? So I get two types of scores. I get scores for the true variables and score for the things. And I'm asking you that your scoring, so your scoring system be fair, that it does not know, it does not have additional insight about these are the variables you need to use to explain what you see. And you don't know who is a true variable and who is a knockoff. And because of this extremity between the x's, what this will tell you is that the scores, no matter what scoring system you use, the zj and the zj wiggle that will come out of your machine, your black box, they have this exchangeability property. 
OK, so they have this extensibility property. And that's what we see. So here is, for those of you who know random forest, very fancy stuff. There's no way I can model the distribution of things by random forests. And uh, we look at just the nulls. And what we see is we see that this is the scores, the random forest algorithm of tr true variables and fake variables. And we can sort of see that they look alike. And I can even show you this is an original variable that's a knockoff. And so that's the calibration point. If I want to report this, you better show me that you're a bit more important than this guy, whom I know is fake. OK, another way to think about these plots visually is that I can plot the scores that original variables get on the horizontal axis. I can get the scores they get on the y-axis. And so because they're exchangeable, I see this sort of distribution around the 45-degree line, okay. indicating that one, what is a mathematical theorem is something you see uh, when you deal with, with data. Okay. So now we get two scores. We get a fake score and a true score, and we're going to combine them into a single score. I want to know whether I need to report a feature or not, a SNP or not. And so the way I'm going to do this is, is quite simple. I have a, a true score, I have a signal, and I'm going to combine them in a signal score that has a property that when I change the order of the features, the sign gets reversed. Okay. So now I have a score for a true variable, I have a score for its knockoff, I want to combine these two info pieces of information into a single number, and I'm going to do this through this W function, but I'm requiring this W function to be anti-symmetric. So we could choose a lot of different things, and it's a research topic as which one should you use. Let's just say we take the difference. Okay, so we take the difference. And if you follow what I'm saying, it's because zj and zj wiggle, they are exchangeable if they are null, then uh, if I'm looking at a variable that does not influence the outcome, then its sign is a coin flip. Okay? And so the way we think about this now is we think about all right, so we, 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 we get genetic data, we create fakes, we put everything this in this big machine, and the big machine returns Ws, scoring the importance of variables. And so I like to think about these Ws as being ordered by magnitude like this and having a plus or minus sign, depending on whether they're positive or negative. And what this statement says is that if I'm a null variable, the sign I'm going to see is just a coin flip. And in fact, the sign of all the nulls by this schema, independent coin flips. OK, so now we're almost there. Because now you say, OK, so all right, so this is the outcome of my experiment. I, I, I create my experiment, and I see this. Should, of course, I do not want to report variables that have a negative sign, because it's a variable for which a fake seems to explain more than the variable itself. So what I would want to do is to fix a threshold t and select all variables that have a score w which is larger than t. I'm not going to report w that are negative. These are variables for which fakes seem more important than the real variables. So how should I use this? So let's report variables that are bigger than t. If I do this, then what's my irreproducibility ratio? Well, it would be the stuff, the number of variables that cannot replicate. They do not influence the response that I'm going to select over the stuff that I'm selecting. But I don't know that stuff because the goal is to know who is null, who is influencing the response, and who is not. I don't know what that is. If I knew, then you don't need me, any of that stuff. But I know, aha, because the nulls, they are symmetric. It's the same, roughly, as the number of nulls that are negative. In other words, the number of nulls that have a plus sign here is, pro is the same as an, is distributed exactly the same way as the number of nulls with a negative sign. I still don't know that what that is because I don't know who is null. But I can count the number of guys with the negative signs. And so I can say, ah, certainly this is less than the number of negatives that I see over here. And that's my estimate of false discovery proportion. Right? And so here I would estimate that, well, if I were to select these five pluses, what would be the FDP one in five? And now you have a method which goes like this. Now we can completely operationalize this way. And we say, OK, let's go back. So let's look at variables in the order of importance. And let's walk backwards. 
So this is the first variable. That the one that receives the high score is positive. I'm going to put a, a dollar sign. And then I march on. I have a second dollar sign, a third, a fourth. And then I go here, and I've got this guy. And at that time, I say, well, if I were to report this fourth, what would be roughly the false discovery proportion? One in four. And so let's continue until the last time this thing is below my target. Let's say 10%. Let's say my target is 10%. I'm going to keep on marching until the ratio between the number of minuses and the number of pluses is, is below 10%. Okay, then I stop. And that's what I'm reporting. And the sort of, um, so that's a method. And the sort of result I'm still puzzled about this, even though I can prove it two or three different ways, it's this. Is that no matter how Y depends on X, no matter what, no matter the sample size, no matter the dimensionality, no matter anything, this method will actually control the false discovery. That is, you're guaranteed that you achieve the target that you set out to do, which is you know that over the long run, your false discovery rate is below what you want, no matter what. And it holds always. OK. All right. So this. Um, Maybe I'll explain on Thursday, like the mechanics. There's a kind of some, some nice mathematics behind this that maybe if I have time, I'll try to explain on, on Thursday. OK, so the knockoff construction, well, now it seems like now we have all the pieces we need. We have a filter that lets you separate true effects from things that cannot reproduce. It requires imputing these fake variables. And it's a bit of an open question how you do this. And I completely agree. Um, we have a general abstraction algorithm that does this. If you had a, a very, very big computer, we have an algorithm that we wrote down that would generate it, but it's not efficient. And then we have some efficient implementations. Uh, we know how to do this for Gaussian fields. We know how to do this for Markov model, hidden Markov model. We know how to do it more and more for general graphical models. And now we're doing something crazy that maybe I'll tell you a bit on Thursday where we try to leverage what we've learned in deep learning and generative probabilistic modeling to use all these fancy tools to actually build knockoffs. Not to build some fancy classifiers, but to actually make reliable fakes, which is a bit of a strange research program. But we use a lot of uh, generative models and deep learning techniques to build fakes. OK, and that seems to work well. OK, so just uh, as a preview uh, of what we'll see on, on Thursday, I just want to let you know at this point that there is a, a, a processing pipeline that you can implement. And so we're going to do a bit of genetics, for example. So I assume people are familiar with haplotypes and genotypes, or is that the case? Yeah? So a haplotype is a set of, you know, we have a two type one. Well, it's what you will see on a, on a you know, chromosome come in pairs. That's what you'll see on a, on a single chromosome. Right, so it's a set of alleles on a single chromosome, and so it, we might encode this by being a zero if you have the common, or one if you have the rare allele. And your genotype, well, we have pairs of chromosomes, and so we inherit one from our mother, one from our father, and so we have the haplotype from our mother, the haplotype from the father, and um, the maternal and paternal haplotypes, and what we can see, what we can measure usually is just the sum of the two. We know the number of common alleles that you have a given location, it's very hard to do phasing. Like we don't really know what this is. We don't really know what this is. But we know we can measure this. And the point is that in the literature, the beautiful literature on, on statistical genetics, people have tried to model the distribution of these things. And one model that has been proven to be very powerful are based on hidden Markov models. And so I'm referring here to the work of Matthew Stevens, uh, from the University of Chicago, Mark Keening, Lee, Browning. A lot of people have developed very fancy um, hidden Markov models to actually model the dependency between SNPs, what people would call the linkage disequilibrium. And these models, they've been very powerful. What they allow you to do is they allow you to do missing data imputation. They allow you to do phasing sometimes. They allow you to do a lot of things. And they've been deployed very successfully. And what we're going to do is we're going to repurpose these algorithms to just build knockoff. I have a good distribution of p of x, which is given by this hidden Markov model. I can estimate the parameters of this hidden Markov model just like anybody else from data. 
And then I can use this hidden Markov model to generate knockoffs. And so we've actually done quite a bit of work trying to build knockoffs and then build this machinery to make discoveries. And so there are several data sets that we've been looking at. And here I'm also uh, including my collaborator, Kiaras Debadi and Matteo Cesia. We've looked at the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, where we studied the risk of getting the Crohn's disease in 5,000 subjects from about 400,000 SNPs. There's this Northern Finland uh, 1966 birth cohort um, that has about the same number of subjects, 330,000 SNPs. We looked at their lipid levels. Which SNP influence your lipid levels? And so uh, here we have two types of lipids level, HDL and LDL. Uh, one is a good form of cholesterol, one is a bad form of cholesterol, and this is a Crohn's disease. And so we applied the method, and so what we see is that the method discovers genetic mutations that seem to influence these phenotypes. And here we compare the number of discoveries we make with the uh, number of uh, discoveries that were made in the original studies, and so we discover more. We make more discoveries. We have a method that is more powerful at discovering things. And what's nice about these things is that since then, and maybe we'll talk about more about this on Thursday, since then there have been follow-up studies on bigger cohorts with more people. So we, have, we can do what people call meta-analysis. We can go back and see what we found but was not found in the earlier study. Has it been found in a bigger study? And what's interesting here is that we see that, yeah, in a lot of cases, we seem to be discovering things that have been confirmed by larger follow-up studies. And I'm not saying that we're doing replicable science completely, but we are clearly on the path to replicable science. Because what we found, which was not found in the original study, was found in later studies of, with much more power. Okay. All right. Okay, and that's also true for the lipids. So this one may talk a bit more on Thursday about how we do all of this. Um, okay, let me just, uh, do I have two minutes, Terry, or two minutes? Okay. I, I just wanted to, uh, since it's a public lecture, I thought I should uh, broaden the topic a little bit in the end. And so we've talked a lot about reproducibility, and um, I'd like to discuss other contemporary issues. And one of them is that, of course, science is about establishing causality. And obviously, if I knew how to establish causality from observational data, from things that are not coming from randomized control experiments, then I think this reproducibility problem would go away. But I think there's a two-way street. That is, by focusing on reproducibility, we can say something about causality. In fact, there are very simple models for which I can claim that is actually true. That if I'm actually able to see, to actually solve the problem I discussed about of conditional independence, you are conditionally dependent if and only if you're causal. And so by focusing on reproducibility, in some cases, in some simplified model, I can claim causality. And so that's a, sort of a two-way street. But what I want to say is that you know, we live, at least I live in the Silicon Valley, where there's a lot of AI, a lot of predictive algorithms. And I grew up in a stats department. And what we've learned in statistics and what people we discover perhaps in machine learning and other fields is that to be able to predict well, we do not need a mechanistic model. But one thing is to say that we do not, that, that we are not using a purely me mechanistic model. Another thing is to say that we're going to go for models that completely ignore causal relationships between variables. And so the point I'd like to make is perhaps by paying closer attention to what reproduces, to what seems to be robust to what reproduces, what I can claim with confidence, we can perhaps in, improve a bit algorithms whose sole purpose is prediction. And how can we do this? We can do this perhaps by making them more, more robust and more fair. And so that's the kind of two things I'd like to discuss. First, the issue of robustness. This is published in PNAS, uh, Proceeding of the National Academy of Science. Um, if you like curly fries, you're very intelligent. I mean, I'm serious. This is the kind of stuff you see published. And that may be true. First of all, I have a problem. Is who does not like curly fries? <laughs> maybe it's true, but maybe it's not. You know, maybe it's like these kind of examples where I talked about you fishing for a lot of things. 
And so you happen to pick a, a correlation that looks significant, but will it be true tomorrow? Will it be true in a different city? Will it be true in a slide? The goal of prediction is not to actually predict the data set, which I do already know. It's to be able to take this prediction and move it in slightly different environment and being able to actually predict new things that I have not seen yet. And so by focusing on things that might be causal, relationships that might be causal, we may actually build better and more robust systems, it's my impression. Because what causality is, it's the stuff that remains invariant when you change conditions a little bit. The second is fairness. Uh, probably you all know that you know, Microsoft put this robot out, Tay, and that robot became sexist and racist very quickly. AI systems, what they use is they use data sets that are full of prejudices. And they use these data sets to learn. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's this famous uh, Harvard professor, Latanya Sweeney, she Googled herself. And when she Googled herself in front of her classroom, I think, Google asked her whether she wanted to run a background check on her because she has an African-American sounding name. When women tend to look for ads on the internet, they're presented with lower paying job than men. Perhaps reflecting the tendency that women, when presenting with high and, and low paying job, are not as arrogant as we are, and maybe not always click on the highest paying job. But that really raises a big issue, which is there is nothing causal about a woman being about gender being more or less qualified for a high paying job. And so you see these data that we learn from, they are full, they contain a lot of prejudices, and Tay is really an example of this. It's things that should not be normal, but we make it normal by learning from things that should not be normal. So in fact, we reify things that does not exist. And this is unacceptable. We can do better than this. And I believe that by focusing on causality, things that truly impact something, uh, we can make algorithms more fair. So I talked a lot. I apologize for this. Uh, my, perhaps my concluding word is that learning from data is not trivial. It requires an intellect. It requires a lot of fancy mathematics and statistics. And I thank you. thing which is that there will be a reception at IPAM uh, uh, following this, uh, the conclusion of this talk. So we'll see you all there. Uh, you know where the IPAM building is located. If not, then just follow the crowd. Meanwhile, we have a few uh, minutes for questions. So if anybody would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Yes, go ahead. That was a great talk. Thanks very much. I just wanted to get your opinion on the reason we find ourselves in this position of I think, the, I think there are many reasons. Perhaps we don't do a good job, and we do need to do a better job. And you know, when people ask me, Emmanuel, how would you fix the problems? I say, I need to teach better. You know, that's the only thing I can do. Maybe my generation is lost, but maybe the next one doesn't have to be. And so I may have to do a better job at teaching. I think it's really, I believe that one of the big reasons is this paradigm shift, that now we're looking everywhere. And we're looking at a lot, so forgive me for being blunt, but I may be in a field where I'm looking at a lot of bogus theories. And when something exceeds a 0.05 threshold, I write a paper about it. But if I'm looking at bogus theories most of the time, 5%, maybe all of what I write is bogus. So I think it's really the look everywhere effect that is not really taken into account. And this look everywhere effect has several forms, for example, you know, I might be in a field where I'm going to create every day of, of my year, I'm going to create a theory, and I'm going to go and try to see if there's a data set out there that validates my theory. But it's also, it can take very different forms. It says, it can be the following. It says, maybe I have a data set, and instead of actually looking at many hypotheses, which is like many theories, I could actually look at 
you know, I spend a lot of time collecting these data. It's about kids, and I watch them grow, and it's expensive. I spent 10 years of my life. And now I'm going to do statistical analysis, but it doesn't pan out. And what do I do? I'm going to change the model a bit. And what I'm, it doesn't pan out. And what I'm going to do? When there maybe these data points was not carefully collected, maybe I'm going to remove a few data points. Because I think after the fact that, well, you know, this kid was really sleeping. In fact, Mina Barber, my collaborator, she worked in psychology and she left the field of psychology for this reason. That when things did not pan out the way she, the PI wanted them to pan out, then we would go back at the data set and say, but I think this kid was sleeping, so we should probably delete this data point. This kid had a bad morning, his mother shouted. So I think that per person also needs to be removed. You know, there are so many things that we can do. We can try so many different models. We can try so many different parameters, even for a single model, that eventually something will work out. And so there is these things, there's this kind of perfect storm of looking at many different things, but also main, looking at many different models, choosing many different parameters, transforming the data in a way that we think is more appropriate, and that, that's what I said. It's a bit of a perfect storm. And there's nothing wrong with this. But we have to know that we can do these things, but we have to account for what we do. This is a small portion of what this could be. Yeah? So when we run, for example, 1,000 random experiments, and then we pick the ones with the most significant data values, then it's, to some extent, it's also a relates to extreme value statistics. Of course. It's extreme value statistics, absolutely. The thing is, right now, what's a bit challenging in the world we live in is it's very difficult to calculate extreme, the distribution of extreme value statistics in models that are so complicated because they involve deep learning or things like that. I, nobody knows how to do these things. And so this is a way of trying to bypass this thing entirely. Learn from your unlabeled data what the distribution is, make, and then you don't have to do extreme value theory. The Benjamin Hochberg, yeah. it requires independence of the test statistics. So here, so it's a very good question. Uh, so the Benjamin Hochberg uh, procedure, I, I don't know. First of all, uh, I'm going to say a lot of things. Um, suppose p is larger than n. So I have more SNPs than observation. How do I compute p values? That's problem number one. Number two, Benjamin Hochberg wants to have p values that are independent. But here, I reuse the same people, so they're going to be extremely correlated. So I don't know how to compute p-values. You see, this is really going back to, to these things, um, which is I have a black box, and it produces stuff like this. And I don't know this, the distribution of this thing. You know, I want to say this point. I would need to know its distribution. But I don't know how I can get that to compute a p-value, to construct the test. I don't know how I can get that. And even if I knew this distribution, we depend on all the other guys, all the parameters in the model I don't know. So how do I do these things? So you see, I'm in a world where I don't even know how to make p-values. No. I hope I'm not overclaiming. Like one thing we have not discussed is how we make these knockoffs. That's why there's a Thursday lecture. Um, but that's, this is assuming if you know how to make them, uh, no. And in fact, it's very good your question because depending on what z you're going to use, what feature you may have less. What is going to change the power of your method? If you use what we'll see on Thursday, if I had good Bayesian model, I would not have to believe the Bayesian story. I could use posterior calculation to actually compute features. And if the model is actually quite good, then the power will go up. So the features can be anything you like. We want features with high power. So uh, if I heard you uh, right, uh, at the end of the talk, this uh, uh, conditional independence <coughs> will, will relate directly to, to causal relationships? Uh, under some conditions. No, okay. no, 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 it's not true. I mean. Uh, 
no, no, no. It's like there are some models of simple disease where, for which it is actually true. In general, it is absolutely not true. You have confounding effects. Right, right. Yeah, that, was, that was my point. No. On the very, but, but here's my point is conditional testing is very important because imagine I have a lot of, I have, I have this luxury problem where I have lots of data. A SNP is always correlated with a phenotype, always, because it's correlated with another SNP and that SNP is correlated with Y. So it's always, so as it's, there's something wrong with marginal testing, which is that as the, size, the sample size increases, everybody will become significant. But in conditional testing, that does not happen. So you can see that it is not the answer, marginal testing. Conditional is what you want. It's like using the words you used this morning, is I have a response Y, I have a lot of variable, what's the mark of blanket of Y? That's what I want to know. One thing that we tend to find useful is to ask for conditional and marginal because that, that tends to remove a lot of confounding effects. Even though it's still, still very complete, but that's being done a lot. Yeah. So right now we focus enormously on conditional. Right, maybe one last question. <clears throat> on a practical level for practitioners, is there some way to access this framework if you're not with the details. Yeah, so we have, uh, I'm sorry I did not put this slide. We have a full R library that, and maybe even a Python library that creates knockoffs for hidden Markov models, Markov chains, Gaussian things. And even we have notebooks that tell you how you can do, um, of course, the problem with the genetic data sets is we would love, I heard lots of good talks today, we would love to be able to publish notebooks that say, here's what we've done, go ahead. Because as the question was, like maybe there are better statistics than you use, so we could discover more things. But the problem with these data sets is I cannot make them public. They're not mine. And there's a privacy issue. And actually getting, so we have three data sets at the moment on our servers. One is the WGCC, NFBC, and then the UK Biobank, which is this big one that just came out. And unfortunately, I, I have granted access because I applied through a process, but I cannot, it's not publicly available. You have to be vetted by it. And so that's the limit of what we can do. But we have mock-up. Suppose your X matrix was like this, your Y, you know. But we cannot give you the data because we don't have the right to. All right, so thank you so much. Let's thank you.